And thank you very much for uh, coming to this evening's talk. For those of you who have not met me before, my name is Gordon Rutter and I'm the organiser and founder of the Edinburgh Fortune Society. We've been meeting for over 20 years now and we always meet on the second Tuesday of every month at 7.30. So during lockdown, we're trying to keep that going as well. Under normal circumstances, we would actually meet in a, a local pub, but obviously that's not possible at the moment. Uh, um, but we are, as I say, still trying to keep to the, the schedule. By putting these talks up on YouTube, we have actually managed to gain a massive, massive audience that wouldn't have been able to come to the talks previously. So that's absolutely fantastic. Um, this talk tonight, uh, just to make sure you're all aware, is being recorded and the plan is to put that up on YouTube after it's been edited. And that'll be there for anyone who's not able to see it live tonight. Because the talk tonight is live, there will be an opportunity to ask questions after the talk. Uh, we'll have a short break immediately after the talk, um, a comfort break as it's euphemistically called. And then after that, we'll reconvene for a, a Q&A session. So I believe believe the thing I need to say is, without further ado, that's customary to be said at this point, sounds horrible. However, it does give me really, really great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, we've known each other for over 25 years. I uh, don't think either of us could say exactly how long, but we first met, oh no, no, it will be about 25 years, I guess. Um, we first met yeah, online as part of the um, the Fortiana email group, and we met in real life the first time at one of the Fortune Times unconventions, and um, we've kept in touch thereafter. And every time I go down to London, I always make sure I meet up with Scott, and often. Um, go to some of the talks that he organises. Tonight's speaker is Scott Wood, who is the co-founder of the London Fortune Society. So tonight's talk is actually a joint Edinburgh Fortune Society and London Fortune Society effort, the first that we've ever done of these. I've been wanting to get Scott to come and give us a talk for quite a long time, but it's quite difficult to get him uh, to come up to Edinburgh. So it's, you know, taking advantage of the situation that's forced on us. And tonight, Scott's going to be talking to us about urban legends. And Scott is um, perfectly designed, as it were, to, um, to talk about that because he's written a book. And normally at this point, I would hold up a copy of the book and say, you know, go out and buy the book but scott's grabbed the screen so you can't see. oh sorry gordon ah no i was trying to bluff it there i don't actually have a copy of your book scott. <laughs> it's one of these things i suspect i've probably thought next time i see scott i'll buy it off him and get it to sign it and i've never actually got round to it however he does have a book out on urban legends called london urban legends the corpse on the tube and that's available from all good bookshops and amazon as well um and I'm sure he'd be grateful of the of the sales of that. And that's exactly what Scott's going to be talking to us about tonight. The corpse on the tube and other urban legends. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Wood. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for um, virtually coming along. Um, yeah, it's nice to be finally speaking for the Edinburgh Fortean Society because uh, I have been coming to come up for a long, long time. And now I'm doing it from my shed. This is the wonders of, uh, wonders of COVID, yet. Yeah, um, I can't believe I've known Gordon for 25 years, but that does sound about right. Man, 40 years, man and boy, the pair of us. Okay, um, so Urban Legends is kind of the, uh, my, the main thing I've mainly dabbled in, and I've been looking at some of these particular stories for quite a few years now. Um, so I thought it'd be the thing to talk to you about this evening. Um, firstly, what I want to clarify is what is uh, an urban legend? Um, in the book, The Tumour in the Whale, um, the, uh, the oh, I've forgotten. <laughs> sorry everyone, I've forgotten the name of the author of The Tumour in the Whale, that's really embarrassing. Uh, no, this is it, this is actually from, yeah, Rodney Dale, yeah. Rodney Dale, no. Um, no. This is actually from Michael Goss, from, a, from a, an issue of the Unknown magazine 
from uh, the 1980s, which before I read the 14 times and after the unexplained part work came out, was a small digest magazine that I was subscribed to from the beginning until the end. Um, in it was a series of uh, articles about urban legends by Michael Goss. Um, and he asked the question, what does, uh, what is an urban legend? And his response was, um, ghost stories and other horror stories, political and social commentaries, dirty jokes, hundreds of them, black humor tales, episodes of revenge and topical pieces which rely on the audience's reaction to AIDS, nuclear war, foreigners, etc. Um, it's a very, very uh, 1980s view of it, I think. But also, um, I think people call things urban legends when they mean something that's apocryphal or something that's fake news or made up or a lie. People will say that's an urban legend, meaning it's something that is immediately discredited. Um, I've got a slightly different view to that, so um, which I will uh, explain to you firstly by, via the means of the Aggleston Rock in Dorset. And like Stud, I think Studland Down in Dorset, uh, overlooking Studland Bay. Now the Aggleston Rock, as you can see, looks like it's landed from space and sort of blasted out across the heath. Um, probably deposited there during the Ice Age or, or, or something, I don't know the geology, but it's been there for hundreds of years and the local folklore uh, explains it's the presence of this large strange object in, in the sense that um, it was thrown by the devil who was standing on the needles on the Isle of Wight and the devil or a giant was um, trying to throw this rock to damage Salisbury Cathedral or a nearby abbey or Corf Castle but the devil's not really good very good at, th at throwing uh, he's the last one to be picked on the uh, football team of all deities uh, so it landed here in it, on, on Studland Heath I think that's what it's called um, so the explanation as to why this strange rock is here is folklore. Um, it's a story people create amongst themselves to explain something and engage in their landscape. This is the Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre, um, soon to be demolished sadly. A wondrous bright pink, strange and unusual shopping centre in a quite a deprived part of London up until fairly recently. It is... Um, it was a, a, a sort of place of the local South American community, lots of curious shops, science fiction, good science fiction bookshop. And it's a bit of an anomaly in like the, uh, the rest of the area that to have a shopping center here. Um, and how some people have explained the presence of the Elephant and Castle shopping center is that here, this uh, lively elephant centered um, working class London area is only about a mile away from the Houses of Parliament. Uh, it was constructed in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, and people people have told the story that um, the government during the Cold War decided that they needed a bunker to flee to if the four minute warning were to go off and hit and would Britain were to be hit by a nuclear attack, and the Elephant and Castle seemed like a good place to build that bunker. In fact, there were um, abandoned Bakerloo line trek tunnels running underneath the Woolworth Road from uh, from the idea of extending the tube further down than from the Elephant and Castle. These tunnels were taken over, backup government offices were built underneath them, but with the Russians watching from spy planes in the 1960s and early 70s, how do you disguise a lot of work building secret government bunkers? Um, you build a shopping centre in an area where no one really expects a shopping centre to be to cover up the work for the government buildings. And the reason why this anomalous thing, like the Eggleston Rock, is there is because of this secret conspiracy. Uh, this is an urban legend. They are, they are essentially the same story in a way. There's something anomalous on the landscape and people invent stories to explain its presence. Um, one just happens to be a shopping centre and one is a rock called the Devil's Anvil. How I see urban legends, it really is as an extension of folklore, but with a contemporary... Um, topics rather than uh, the ideas of fairies or uh, demons or other such things. Um, I'm going to be talking about three urban legends that I've been particularly involved in researching and talking about and I enjoy talking about them a lot. The first one is the corpse on the tube, the idea that someone encounters a, a dead body on public transport, the helpful terrorist where um, someone gains a warning, an act of kindness gets a warning about a terrorist attack and the hidden insult the idea that um, 
within a luxury item or a prestigious item, someone that has hidden something offensive, essentially. Um, and to start off with the story of the courts from the tube, I am going to show a video because I don't, I, I've told this story once already and it looks a bit more dramatic. Urban legends are like contemporary fairy tales. Just as fairy stories used to warn people why not to go into the woods at night, urban legends have a warning about what could happen to you if you go into the London Underground at night. The Corpse on the Tube is a perennial and typical example of this. The story begins with a young woman who's recently moved to London. She's coming home from work or university. The carriage is empty. She's not sure where to sit, so she sits opposite three people in the same carriage as her. She's not completely sure about them. They look like they might be on drugs, they look a bit shifty. The girl, particularly, seems completely out of it. She starts reading her book and in good learning to be a Londoner tradition, she ignores the people she's sitting with. At the next stop though, a middle-aged professional man gets on and sits down next to her. He starts acting very, very strangely. He pretends that he knows her, even though she doesn't know him. He says to her, hello, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. And then leans in close and whispers to her, if you know what's good for you, get off with me at the next station. Do you know what's good for you? Get off with me at the next station. The young woman doesn't know what to do about this. She doesn't like the look of the wasted people opposite her. And she thinks that there will be other people on the platform, so it is safe to get off of the train at the next stop. So she does. There, the smartly dressed middle-aged man reveals himself to be a doctor and says, thank goodness you got off the train with me. The three people opposite you, uh, the woman was dead. I'm a doctor and I can tell. I could also tell because she had a pair of scissors sticking out the back of her head and they were using the un London Underground to dispose of her corpse. And that's, 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 just... oh, hang on. Let's not share that. Um, let's go back to that. Sorry. So night tubes start on the underground in August 2016. So I've always wondered who rides the night tube like three and four in the morning. Surely that's Jeff the dead Nelson. hour, the quiet. Sorry. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, this was going really smoothly earlier. Sorry, everyone. Hmm. Very, very sorry, Gordon. Ah, bear with me a sec. We can edit this out later, can't we? That's the idea, yeah. Thank you. So honestly, serves me right for... Uh... I can see a big thing that says resume slideshow. Is that... There we go, thank you. You know what, when you panic sometimes and you don't see what's in front of you. So that's essentially the story of the corpse on the tube. Um, I first encountered it on uh, an internet forum. Um, it's pretty much the story that I told on the tube there three or four years ago when you could travel on public transport and go to pubs. Um, it, there's, ver there's various different versions. Um, it's always uh, a young woman who is unaccompanied and encounters some people, two or three on the train. One of them is act is unconscious and uh, turns out to be dead. It's always a middle class, middle aged man that rescues her, um, and the, and that's and that's kind of it. This is this is the first time I encountered it on the thirty first of October two thousand and eight. So um, one person posted the story and people said, "Oh, that's an urban legend. That's not true." And someone posted this saying, "Okay, I lived in London, and this story is about my sister's friend who went to." To the University of Queen Mary's London. It is a true story and the first post about it is accurate. Happened years ago and it isn't a myth. It still haunts her today and it's pretty rude to have been turned into some urban legend, which is an awful, 
Um, it was also discussed on the forum, someone saying, I agree with the above post. They probably pulled her by the shoulders or arms. The scissors were obviously what killed her, not what was holding her up. Plus the guy would have known she was dead because she's got a pair of scissors in her head, enough said. They'd have to prop her up on the seat. And since she's dead, she had glazed over look, a glazed over look in her eyes or her eyes would be closed. Um, the glazed over eyes part is, is, is actually worthy of note. The rest of it's a bit icky. Um, oh, turning it into an urban legend. Uh, sorry about that person on the internet. Uh, that, that is my book. Um, yeah, it's still out there. And there's um, the, the tumour in the whale. Now this story, as a, my book was um, based on, is, is about London urban legends, but the idea of having an urban legend book about London, while there are leg, urban legends um, located in London and told about London and London people, they're, it's like all folklore, it's international and it pops up wherever there's people who tell stories. Um, the, the, the British, ver there's a British rail version of a young woman on a train who is sit up, sat opposite two gir three girls, the middle of whom was staring at the girl all the way. And she's rescued by a man and got off and to explain that the middle, the two girls were transporting another dead, dead girl. And that's the reason why the girl was staring at the victim was that uh, the young woman who had to get off was because she was dead. The New York version, uh, this is from a book called The Affair of Dame Rumour, which is a really good book about urban legends before urban legends got that name. Um, the New York version is kind of a lot more empowering. Um, it's of a, a, a lone woman traveling the New York subway. Um, and there's a guy staring at her um, all through her journey. Um, and she, instead of being afraid or needing to be rescued by a man, she just stands up and slaps him across the face where he uh, falls out of his seat and falls on the ground and turns out to be dead. And it's only afterwards she finds out that actually he's a, he's a, he's a known alcoholic and has basically died of a heart attack on the tube and he's been riding around for no one knows how long, um, staring at people. And it's only when uh, he was whacked that people actually found out. Um, there are other versions. There's a Sicilian version that appeared in the Tumor in the Whale, in the whale that actually tells the uh, the story from the point of view of the um, the people transporting the corpse. It's two brothers with uh, uh, their grandfather, and the grandfather dies while they're on holiday. It's a bit of a holiday at Bernie situation, and they. Um, they, they don't want to pay for him to travel in a coffin that would cost too much and he's got a return ticket so they just dress him in his best suit and uh sit him on the on the train and they were going to transport him back and then just say that he died at home when he got back from his holiday it's fine it's cheap they've got the ticket anyway but the, the brothers leave the carriage for a moment leave, leaving granddad's corpse there come back and find the corpse gone and two people already sitting sitting in the in the carriage where granddad had been sitting a fight breaks out and they find out that what had happened is the train had lurched the case the brothers had put on the on the upstairs storage had uh, landed on granddad's head the pe people had checked him found that he was dead thought the case had killed him and um, threw his body off the train um so that's a, a, a jokier version um the place we're looking at here i believe is uh london ontario um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Stuart. Uh, there's a stolen car with a dead granny in as well. Uh, I was going to get to that in a moment. Uh, you're right, there's a granny on the roof and people steal the car with the corpse still in the roof. There's also the urban legend of um, s well, someone who lives in a flat, often in London, where you're not allowed to keep pets, and they've, but they've kept a pet cat. The cat dies and there's no garden to bury the cat, so they have to dispose of it in a way that the, the landlord doesn't find out. And they ended up trying to leave the cat places and people keep giving it to them. Or sometimes the cat is stolen by someone. Um, and then obviously they get a surprise when they think they've stolen something precious. It's actually just a dead cat, precious only to the person who lost the cat. There's lots of different iterations of this legend and I'm getting a little bit off topic. Um, urban legends aren't just this linear thing. They merge into each other and uh, sort of support each other in a way. So there's the dead cat and the dead granny and the dead granddad and the one that we're talking about here, which is the menacing of a young woman on public transport um, in various places. This I think is uh, London, Ohio. Correct me if I'm wrong there, anyone. Uh, there's a version of this story that goes back to a magazine that's published in 1883. Um, 
stuff. Lots of versions after this on public transport. Uh, this one is uh, three sisters going into uh, the city just on Christmas Eve to do some Christmas shopping and they're out quite late and they have to get the last stagecoach back to where they live. And the three, the, the three sisters and the brother get on, then like three or four hoodlums also get onto the stagecoach, one of, one of whom seems really drunk, really out of it. And as the stagecoach goes along its journey and at each stop, one of the hoodlums taps their friend and goes, okay, right, night everyone, night Sid, make sure that you get home safe. And each stop, everyone would do that, leaving finally the brother and the three sisters with the man who is passed out drunk. And obviously, um, you can guess what happens. The brother goes to check on the man to make sure he doesn't miss his stop because they think he's passed out drunk, gets a close look at his body, panics, and uh, tells his three sisters to get off at the next stop. They're getting off. They, they're going to walk home from there. And it's only when uh, they get off the, uh, the, the, the stagecoach that the brother says, I'm sorry, he, that was a dead body that those men had abandoned. He had his throat cut so wide it could have killed four men. Um, and I know that's, that's always stuck with me as well. Hang on, where's... And uh, the theme of the courts from the conveyance um, appeared in continents in the 1880s. Um, and it's not new at all. Uh, there's ideas that there were stories in Europe before then that were actually fictional stories uh, telling similar similar tales that have sort of been absorbed into folklore and repeated right up until now, right up until um, the present day. Um, I think what this expresses, what this, what this urban legend has generally expressed is the sense that if you're on public transport, you don't always know who you're traveling with. They could be a criminal, they could be a corpse. Um, being amongst, being in confined spaces with strangers is quite a dangerous thing. Though um, a version that I encountered the other day has taken it ever so slightly further and it's now a commentary on technology rather than, um, than uh, stranger danger. It's, um, it popped up, I think, in the International Contemporary Legend Facebook group where people were talking about driverless cars and wondering what would happen whether um, a driverless, someone would die while in a driverless car. So obviously they're not going to lose control of the vehicle and cause a traffic accident. So maybe it's OK that eventually when you arrive at your destination, you're, you, in a sense, haven't arrived because you're dead. And that would be better than an accident. But then somebody else sort of created the scenario of um oh everyone grandma's here kids go say hello to grandma she's just arrived and run into the car to find granny dead so i think urban legends express ideas outside of what's generally in the narrative and i think that one will be with us for a while um questions later if you want to talk more about that i'm kind of because i've got three i'm kind of rushing through these a little bit um uh, here's the website, which is the Tube Professional Rumour Network, which is called Tube Prune. Um, I had a look at this um, a while back to look at what, what these are, essentially, is people who work in a certain professional arena have these places where they, they share rumours and debunk rumours and basically have a bit of a moan. Um, there's a Tube Prune for tube drivers. There's also an Army Prune for people in the Army and uh, an uh, a, a airplane pilot prune where people who work on uh, international flights share rumours. I had a look there, there were some people who worked on the London Underground sharing stories of people who've actually died. Um, and I certainly don't think, obviously, we, and so many people travel on the tube. Um, people have been born and died on the tube. It's just the narrative of uh, the, the, the corpse staring at you or someone being transferred on the tube is that we're kind of looking at here rather than the fact that people do just die on the tube. Okay. Sticking with the death and public transport goes to the next urban legend I wanted to talk about, which is the the stranger's warning or the terrorist warning. Um, encountered this just after the 11th of September 2001, after the uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon in America, which is coming up to its 20th anniversary as well, which is, uh, yeah, I know, Gordon, it's uh, 20, nearly 20 years. Um, this this cropped up in my email in my email feed. Um, well, they weren't called feeds, then were they? Um, in my email, which is someone saying 
Morning all, had a bizarre message from my brother in the early hours of this morning. His girlfriend's friend was shopping in Harrods on the weekend. There was an Arab man in front of her who was buying a number of things with cash. It was a few pounds short, so the girl offered him three pounds to cover it. Um, after she left the store, the man ran out and uh, thanked her. And as a way of thanking her, she uh, warned him not to travel on the tube today. She was a little thrown by this as she went to the police. The police were very skeptical in order to, but in order to eliminate her suspicions, gave her the photo ID book of all known dissidents in the UK. It was on the second, he was on the second page listed as a known terrorist. Um, I don't believe the Met actually have a list of dissidents in the UK. Um, but that's for the story. Um, this story was all over the UK. Um, 20 years, just under 20 years ago. Um, it was being told about um, people in Birmingham were, being, were paying 30p to someone in a cash and carry and being warned not to go to Birmingham town centre. In America, it was often about um, don't drink Coca-Cola after Halloween or avoid shopping malls after Halloween. An act of kindness for a stranger, to which a stranger would bring a warning of of fear and terror and Snopes obviously the great site um helped a lot with me researching this because they um they gathered it all and uh, gathered all different versions of it um it was, it was so great that in 2001 West Midlands police had felt the need to release th this announcement that there, this was just an urban myth and there is no intelligence suggests that in the West Midlands where people were worrying about it um there, there was no evidence of a terrorist attack and no, the police hadn't heard anyone who'd paid some given someone a, a gift or uh, done an act of kindness and received a warning about a terrorist attack what i like what i liked about the time at the time when these came out was um in london it was three pounds in harrods that you got the stranger's warning while in birmingham it was 30p in a cash and carry in manchester it was some just before september the 11th it was something different um in manchester it was uh, a young man in a Burger King who didn't enough didn't have enough money for his Whopper um, in a Manchester Burger King. Uh, so there was a young woman be behind him in the queue. Uh, she helped him out with his Whopper with a few pence. And um, after, when she left with her, whatever she was eating, the young man again followed her and said to her, thank you very much for your kindness. I have to let you know, don't go to the Trafford Centre this weekend. And he said that to her in a soft Irish accent. The implication being, this was after the 1996 IRA uh, bombings of, of Manchester, that he was, an, he was in the know somehow about IRA terrorism and wanted to thank the stranger that helped him with his whopper. Um, so, um, in the, so in the 1990s, that was, um, we were afraid of Irish terrorists in the, in the 20, early 21st century. It was uh, Muslim extremists. Um, and there are other, again, there are other versions um, and other devils of the time. Uh, this gentleman with his astonishing moustache is uh, Sir Basil Thompson, who was leader of the Metropolitan Police during, in London during uh, the First World War. And he wrote a book called Queer People, meaning strange people, about his experiences afterwards, where he would, criminals who were working the black market and rumours and strange things that um, he encountered. Yeah, thank you, uh, M. Yeah, the wallet version as well of the story. Um, I heard that after the 7-7 bombings, where um, a friend had heard that someone had dropped their wallet outside of, I think it was in John's Lane uh, Synagogue, no, actually they dropped their wallets. Someone had dropped a wallet, um, picked it up, gave it to the person who dropped their wallet. And they said, thank you very much. Keep away from the St. John's Lane synagogue, synagogue on a certain day, insinuating that there was gonna be a, a, a an attack. They, they were everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It was even made into a joke about um, you help someone in an Arabic dress um, with some money and they say thank you i must tell you do not go to i don't know waffle house or pizza or pizza land and and the person who did the kind of says what is it going to be attacked I said no no just the food is awful um so it got it got it was so frequent it was actually made into a joke but back to um basil thompson or shagger thompson as he was known because after he published his book he was arrested for soliciting a woman on a park bench in hyde park so even though he's a policeman he was a bit naughty um, one of the chapters in his book, um, Queer People, was about a rumour going around London uh, during the First World War. Hang on. 
um, it was the Grateful German and the Tubes. Um, this tells the story of, a, of again, a woman. Uh, this time she's um, at, at the front, um, tending to the wounded, and she brought a German officer back from death, death's door. And to thank this nurse, uh, with a burst of gratitude, he said to her, I can tell you no more, but beware of the tubes in April. And this will be April 1915. Um, this particular story is against the background of before the First World War, London had a, a large, thriving um, German community. Um, pre World Wars, London um, Germans were seen as the brothers of, of English people. There were, a lot of builders were German. Uh, obviously, a lot of the royal family are German. Um, we were we were twin nations, and it was only with the with the start of the First World War that that was really torn. And with the beginning of the war, all of London's German communities were ethnically cleansed, ethnically cleansed that everyone was driven out. A few people were killed in riots all across London at the, at the start of the war, but most but German London then pretty much ceased to be. There's a couple of German churches in places like Sydenham that. Um, are there instead of the only memorial to um, the community that has, is now gone because of people's anger. In fact, there's a park in Sydenham that has a very long, narrow uh, pond in it. There's actually a representation of the Rhine for the German community to feel at home back in the 1910s. So anyway, so there was fear of danger, strange danger all over London because there was a German community and Germans were suddenly seen as the enemy with the First World War. Um, it, it happened in, in uh, the Second World War as well. So in 1940, there was a story circulating of a nurse treating a captured German pilot who rewarded her kindness by being told her to make sure he wore, she wore her gas mask on the 15th of September. Um, oh, and the, the nurse was, was, and it, it goes back to the World War I story, essentially. Now, Basil Thompson actually did that brave thing of trying to, every, everyone he, he heard, someone he heard the story from, he went back to the person who told them the story and told them the story and back to the, person who told them the story and as he says in his book we took the trouble to trace his story from mouth to mouth until we reached the second second mistress in a boarding school she declared that she had it from, heard it from a charwoman who cleaned the school but the lady stoutly denied that she'd ever told so ridiculous a tale um the, the story goes further back though um than that and it changes as it goes further back in time. This story is from the 19th century and is illustrated by, um, hang on a sec, I need to double check the name of the author, Tim Bird, that's it, Tim Bird, who wrote this excellent graphic novel of the Great North Wood, which is a beautiful evocation of history and landscape and forests um, set in South London. So it's basically all good stuff. Um, buy it if you're interested in any of those things. But one of the chapters, he tells the story of uh, Ned, Ned Righteous. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the story and you use Tim's illustrations. Uh, he gave me permission to use them. And you let me know if, you start, if this starts to sound familiar at all. So this is a doctor who lives in Streatham, a Dr. Gardner, who one day finds a man at his doorstep. And he in, in the story, he others the man saying he's a strange fella who looks almost like a fairy. He's, he's, he's basically a traveller who lives in the Great North Wood and says, my wife is in labour, she's fallen ill, I fear she may die. The doctor says, yes, take me to her. And then the man says, we, we're, in the, we're in a camp in the woods, which is gypsy territory. And the doctor's very nervous, uh, but agrees to go with the, the mysterious man. And they disappear into the woods. Um, they arrive at the camp. The, doc, the, 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 the wife and the baby are at death's door and through his skill, the doctor saves both of their lives and the, gy the gypsy gentleman says, because um, um, I don't want to say his name until the end. So the, so the man thanks him and says, here, take a guinea for your trouble, because this is way pre NHS. People had to pay doctors. Uh, but the doctor says, no, thank you. Your, your wife and child will, will appreciate the money more than I would. So instead, instead of uh, paying the doctor, he thanks him by saying, if you ever have trouble in the forest, just say that you know me, say that you're a friend of Ned Righteous. And so that happens. Uh, the doctor is traveling through the woods one day and two rough looking sorts grab the reins of his horse and he knows that he's gonna be mugged. And he says, would you hurt a friend, a friend of Ned's, Ned Righteous? The two men, um, look at him and say, hang on a minute, how do you know that name? And lead him to back to the camp. 
and say, this man claims to be a friend of yours. And he said, oh yeah, it's, it's Dr. Gardner. He said, to save, save the life of my son and my wife. And the two men who were gonna attack the doctor said, oh, if we knew you were that Dr. Gardner, we wouldn't have attacked you at all. I'm really, really sorry. Um, it's essentially, in my opinion, uh, we'll be opening the microphones during the Q&A at the end if you want to take this up with me. It's the same story again. It's a marginalised community that's slightly out, regarded as slightly out of society. Someone commits an act of kindness towards that community and they're rewarded with some knowledge this in, or a token of some sort to avoid a terrorist attack, to avoid an attack by a, a, an enemy power, um, to avoid um, being mugged in the woods. Um, but there's one other word, version where an act of kindness gains knowledge of a different group of people. Again, the Great Northwood, it's great. Do check it out. Uh, this is uh, early 20th century journalist Nancy Spain. Um, she saw ghosts a couple of times. She was a, a fascinating character. Her autobiography, which I got some of this from, is definitely worth a read. Um, she wrote in one of her columns, she was a columnist for the Daily Mail, um, she wrote in one of her columns that she was coming out of um, um, one, of the, one of the department stores on Piccadilly, Fortnum and Mason's one day, and um, she's in a hurry and she wants to get a taxi, uh, public transport again, and a, a, a woman, in a, a strange looking woman in a turban, who she recognises as Lady M, comes out of the um, a taxi is fumbling with her bag um, and trying to get some change. But Nancy's in such a hurry. She says, don't worry, I'll get it. Pays the woman's taxi fee and then sort of gets the cab driver to take her off to wherever she wants to go. To which the taxi driver says, oh, you made it. You were robbed there, miss. That was Lady M underscore. She's not named in the story. Um, she could buy and sell all of us. Um, the next day when Nancy's speaking to her mother and says, oh, I had this thing happen and I accidentally paid Lady M underscores taxi fare, even though she's really rich, her mother goes pale and shows her the head, the, the, the front of the local, of the London newspaper saying, Lady underscore dies in fire. And the very moment that Nancy Spain Lee sees um, Lady M going into Fortnum and Mason, she's actually dying in a fire. So her act of kindness gains knowledge of ghosts amongst us. Um, Nancy saw ghosts a number of times though. She tells another story of being in a restaurant and an old friend of hers from school who died at school when she was at school, um, walks into a restaurant at that Nancy's sitting in and orders a Scotch egg. Um, <laughs> uh, and she, Nancy leaps up to go say hello to this departed friend who then vanishes, leaving a hard clear line for a second as a piece of paper does when it burns in a fire. She could write and she can imagine amazing ghosts. So again, I think the helpful terrorist will be with us a lot. I think both of these stories, both the corpse on the tube and um, the helpful terrorist, they've got older origins. We tell stories now that are old without realizing that they are old because they've got contemporary stuff. There's don't drink Coca-Cola, go to the tube, Harrods, um, these are like, in a way, um, different versions of a film. So the early version is like this film Seven Samurai, uh, which is obviously samurai with, with their um, swords and their hats, uh, adventuring in medieval Japan, which was made into the Magnificent Seven. So um, different hats, cowboy hats and guns, fighting in the Wild West, up to even the film Battle Beyond the Stars, which is a retelling of more The Magnificent Seven than Seven Samurai, which has spaceships and uh, ray guns, but it's all telling the same story of seven warriors uh, gathered together to defeat a wicked lord who's imperiling a village. Urban legends are kind of like those films. And I really, I just did that to just talk about um, Battle Beyond the Stars, because it's a great film, check it out, it's on YouTube. But before you do that, the final story uh, I want to talk about is the hidden insult, which is less clear cut than the other two. It's harder to trace a sort of a lineage to it, and, and it may have more real world things attached to it. Uh, the, the chap glaring at you there is the fashion designer Alexander McQueen, who died, um, I think about, I can't remember exactly when it was now, 2004, 2005, I think. Um, possibly later. And when he died, um, there was, uh, a story about him was told again as a way of uh, 
memorializing him as a way of celebrating who he was. He was like a, a working class character who um, did amazing fashion and didn't totally fit in the fashion establishment, but you know, was 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 part of it. Um, I, when I was looking it up, I found a journalist writing about how his fashion shows would often be accompanied by freak weather and uh, um, rainstorms and traveling to his shows in a storm. He could actually affect nature. His, the trousers he designed were so good. Um, why has that gone blank? All right, yes. Uh, now the story that was told um, is that as an apprentice at a tailor on, Sa at, on Savile Row in London, he was uh, chalking out um, the material for a suit that was gonna be cut and st stitched together for Prince Charles of all people recently in the news. Um, and as a bit of a, you know, cheeky born in Lewisham, grew up in the East End uh, joke, he wrote, I am uh, expletive deleted um, inside the suit that Prince Charles was gonna wear. And then it was stitched up and the monarch received it and, and wore it without ever knowing that this cheeky message was in there. Um, going back a bit further, um, I found that what he may have actually written was McQueen was here in other versions rather than I am a in expletive deleted or in a really early version that I found from the early 1990s it was McQueen was here back when people wrote was like like they're from the Beano now the version with the McQueen was here was um actually a report on another uh story of um, something offensive being hit, hidden in the property of royalty. This was, um, and this is actually a story I heard when I was in my first job in the work canteen in the early 1990s. Someone was telling a story about the Queen's Rolls Royce in this case, uh, people working in, in the car plant as it was being assembled, knowing that it was um, for the Queen, or it was, or it was in being, oh no, that's actually the, the true story, had hidden, drawn a swastika inside within the car body and hidden some pornography in there as a way of sort of joking, uh, just having something within the, 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 the car that the Queen drove so that is basically earthy and offensive and would really upset her if it was ever found. There's, um, there's an American version of this story um, that more expresses, expresses a sort of class war sentiment where um, a, a rich man with a rich car, say a Daimler or something, has got an annoying rattle in his car. Whenever he drives it, it's a perfect car, it's brilliant, but it rattles all the time. He takes it back to the car showroom and they have to take the whole thing to bits until they finally find um, a Coke can or a bottle with some stones in it hidden deep within the car with a, with a message saying, so you finally found the rattle, you rich SOB. Um, There are other versions of this story. Um, those of you, uh, we were all lamenting our age earlier on at the beginning of the event. Um, those of you who remember the, the Great Brit War Battle of the 1990s, Blur versus Oasis. Um, uh, and there was great rivalry b between two slightly banal uh, rock bands. Um, one story that emerged out of that was uh, appeared in Pop Bitch, which is the scandal newsletter, really good for picking up some urban legends from, where um, some years ago, a wait, Oasis, who at the time were the were the successful band. They sold loads more, they toured more, their albums sold a lot more, and uh, Blur were regarded more as the underdogs at this time. They bought a, a vintage EMI mixing desk from a studio in Australia, but before it was shipped over to Britain, typical rock star extravagance, uh, a fan of the band Blur wrote Blur inside the mixing desk, and, and it was wondered whether the gal has ever found this handiwork hidden inside it. This is also footballer Joe Cole, who, um, I need to get this right, because he's a footballer. This is him in his wedding suit. Uh, he got married, he had a very expensive suit tailored for him. I think at this time he left West Ham and went to play for another team, probably Chelsea, I can't remember. And it turns out the person who, uh, like McQueen, was putting the suit together was a West Ham fan. So before it was all stitched up, they chalked a West Ham insignia and wrote Judas inside it as a way of punishing him for leaving the football team. Oh, here we go. Yeah, um, it was Chelsea. There's still a bit of a grudge about Cole leaving the Hammers. 
So it's possible if Joe would look in the lining of the jacket, there'd be a full West Ham insignia chalked on it, complete with a few choice words, several of which were Judas. And that idea of something hidden in plain sight, this is uh, apparently uh, some swastikas. Um, I'm not sure we can show swastikas anymore on YouTube, but that were put marked out in trees by the Nazis. And this leads us on to things hidden in plain sight in buildings um, as a way of punishing people, which is linked to the idea of hiding something within something. Uh, this, what you're looking at there, what you want to be looking at is the red brick steeple with the sort of the green spire. That is uh, St. Peter's Church, Corn Hill. It's quite an old building because it's in the city of London. It's uh, It's got offices built right into it. Um, and the story goes that when, I think it's 55 Corn Hill, the opposite, the office is in front of the building, decided to uh, extend their offices. The original plans for this would, um, extended about one foot or a few inches onto church land. When the church realized this, they forced the architect or the builders to completely redesign the building. So it didn't do that, um, which they did, uh, but as a way of getting revenge against the church, these, I don't know if you can see at the very top and at the side, it's two demons, but there's three demons. Um, let's see if we can get my cursor up. There's a demon here, a little demon here, and this little demon here does look down at the entrance of St. Peter's Church, um, staring down as a way of make, on the people who made the, the, the building be redesigned. So it's a way of saying, oh, heck to you, people who uh, made us redesign. So this is uh, this is from an old copy of the uh, London Evening Post, which had lots of cartoons on um, different London legends. And it's again, crouching high on an office of building in Cornhill, stone devils glare down at the church of St. Peter below. They were put there by an architect who had just lost a dispute with the church authorities and erected them as a token of his displeasure. There they are again, they are actually bloody terrifying. Um, and you can well imagine they were put there as, 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 as someone being angry. In fact, the one, one of them you're looking at there is actually the logo of the logo of the London 14 Society because it's just such a great thing. I like it a lot. Yep, hideous things. Yep, again, it was William Kent's walk in, in 1951 book Walks in London says if you look across the road, we see high on the high on number 54, a devil in stone. A legend says the builder had a feud with the church and told them to go to the devil. A curse was laid upon him by the verger, but definitely, but defiantly, he erected these figures. This is uh, William Neatby, who was a ceramicist who actually designed and built those demons. He, the reason I, I, I looked into this um, after finding out who designed them, he himself was this sort of genius ceramic designer. He trained as an architect, but then went into ceramics and ended up designing the facades and decorations on quite a lot of uh, Edwardian buildings, Victorian Edwardian buildings. Um, and I think looking at his works explain why these demons are quite so striking. So we, we've just looked at his works on the Cornhill building. This is his work on the, um, the I think it's the Everard or Evershaw printers building in Bristol. This is some of the patterns he, the ceramics he did for the Winter Gardens in Blackpool, I think. This is thought that this was his first wife uh, was used as a model for them. This is the Turkey Cafe he designed for in, which is in Leicester. And these are the uh, ceramics he did for the, um, the meat hall at Harrods. We're back in Harrods. He was basically, um, and the, the, this is uh, his work for the Fox and Anchor Pub in Smithfield in London. Very, very talented artist, great imagination. And if you can look at what are supposed to be foxes on either side of the sign here, they actually do look like yowling hellhounds. So he did have a sense of the macabre in a lot of his designs. Um, I also looked, I went to Guildhall when I was writing the, the Urban Legends book and went through the parish notes of the time when the office block was being built. Um, and there was actually a bit of a dispute. Um, the, the people building the building wanted to extend and eventually they made a donation to the church that allowed them to do some building work on the church. So there was a bit of a party wall a dispute to start with where you've got a wall and you're working out who's responsible for the wall but it, 
eventually, according to the notes of the church, it was, it did end amicably. And it's possible that that dispute sort of puts a bit of a seed into this urban legend that it, there, was a, there was a dispute. And then those hideous demons, people put two and two together and made hideous demons um, and not a, a talented uh, architectural ceramicist who really enjoyed creating strange and wonderful macabre things. Um, however, this story does um, appear in other buildings, particularly church buildings. Um, this is St Luke's Church on Old Street in London. And um, the story goes again, this is in William Kent's book, Walks in London, um, that it got the name Lousy, Lousy St Luke's. For a um, and it was known as that, but people generally thought that was because the congregation were a bit bug ridden. But William Kent said that the reason why it was called that was um, a, a builder who was building the church sort of fell out with the church warden. And um, so as revenge, when he put the weather vane at the very top of the of the church, he um, he did it in the shape of a louse as, as revenge. Um, here is the weather, weather vane when it came down in the 1950s. It wasn't a louse, it was a dragon. Um, but again, the story persisted. There's also a story of a church, a, a um, small carving in a church in uh, Mitcham, where the stone carver was, was carving one face on one side of a window and he was being told his work was rubbish by a local member of the parish who was complaining to him about his work. So he ended up, the second face on the other side of the window was a caricature of the person moaning at him. And again, at St Giles Church in Camberwell, this is again from um, the evening, the London Evening Post cartoons, which were done by, I can't remember the name of the artist, same name as the director of the Lord of the Rings books, Peter Jackson, but different Peter Jackson, obviously. Um, on the south turret of the ch church of St. Giles Camberwell, can see a set of gargoyles said to represent St. Ranulph Churchill, Gladstone, Lord Salisbury, and William Wilberforce, and Lord John Russell. So political characters being caricatured on a church. I, I went to see them because I used to live opposite St. Giles. They're too weather beaten now to really be able to recognize that, but it's possible. Um, this is a, a stone face on the side of buildings on Telegraph Hill in New Cross, not far from where I'm broadcasting to you. And it said that these were built again by the German builders who were doing a lot of the building in London before the First World War. And these faces were thought to be um, satirical depictions of the German royal family. Um, when they were built and leading us back to the previous story they were desecrated during the anti-german riots in uh, 1914. Um, but going up to a bit more to the present day um, another story of the london olympics now is seen as a, a as a high point in british culture and it did it did feel like that it was an exciting time but London as being London as we were quite cynical about it before it came along and one story that again appeared in the pop bitch newsletter suggested that um, the artist who was putting together these iron Olympic rings that went on display in London before before the before the games began had let deposited a little comment on the Olympics and the government of the time who cut a lot of funding to the arts um, within the um, rings and then welded it back up. It was poo. They basically pooed in the rings and then um, welded them back up as a comment again within a prestigious thing um, as a hidden insult or, or, or comment. Um, now, what I like about this legend is it's, it's, it's probably, again, it has um, probably has old, much older versions um, attached to it, uh, but there's a greater level of truth in there. It's quite possible that um, Alexander McQueen did write something offensive in Prince Charles's suit. Apparently, um, one side I don't have here is that once the story got out, apparently um, all of Prince Charles's suits were and coats were checked to make sure there was nothing rude written inside them. And there wasn't, don't worry, Prince Charles, there was nothing offensive in there. We didn't find anything. Um, but I was talking about a while back in those times when you could go and talk about esoteric things in the pub. I found myself in the pub with a couple of tailors and um, they actually said, no, yeah, we do do that. Apprentice tailors, not always insults, but get chalk and draw amazing patterns and sketches within suits before sewing them up. So there's lots of people with tailored suits. Um, who don't realise that um, there's these drawings within them. It's like an apprentice thing that, that, that we do. 
Um, so the hid the hidden insult could could be out there. I'm kind of glad about that because it's unlike the other two legends that kind of the first one, the corpse on the tube, sort of is about warning women not to travel alone in case you get harassed by you encounter strange dodgy people or um, a, a staring corpse. And the, the stranger's warning is essentially about xenophobia and how you could be amongst people you don't trust against a, a marginalized community. But the hidden insult is more about, um, it's an urban legend that kicks up rather than down. It's always the underdog that is has their name written inside the mixing desk or writes a rude thing inside, inside a coat that's worn by royalty or a car that's gonna be driven by the queen. It's kind of um, the people from underneath, sort of the folk getting their own back a little bit. In, in ways that hopefully the people in power never really find out about. Um, that's the end of the talk. Um, we're going to do a Q&A. I think we'll have a comfort break first. Um, Gordon will appear in a moment. Um, and then we'll do questions. If you want to put your hand up for a question, I, we can open your microphone and we can I can see if I can help you at all. And if Gordon wants to pile in too, we greatly benefit from his brain too, I'm sure. So, uh, Thank you very much. My contact details are there. It's at 14 London on Twitter. The web, the London 14 Society website is there and it's 14 Society at live.co.uk. Um, we have been doing online events, but I'm having a bit of a break to be honest. So it's really nice to be invited to do this because it's really good to look at this stuff again. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Gordon. Comfort break time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Scott. Yep, yeah, as you're saying, we're going to have a couple of minutes comfort break and then we'll reconvene for a Q&A session. So a couple of minutes or so and then we'll have questions. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. See you all in a minute. I'm going to make a cup of tea.
Ah. Okay, is everyone good? Um, so, well, I think probably the easiest way is if we do the questions in two ways, because I know there are some people who don't have microphones. So if you want to ask a question yourself, if you put your hand up, as Joel has done, and we'll get to you and uh, you can unmute yourself or we'll unmute you. We can, we can or unmute. alternatively, can unmute um, you can put your question in the chat and I know there's one question there already. So let's start with the Q&A section and we'll go to Joel first. Um. <laughs> I think I just I just muted you as you unmuted yourself or some variation thereof. Sorry about that, Joel. Are we there? You're there. Yep. I'm there. Thank okay. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk. I, I I just wanted to briefly say I'm afraid there there are real life examples of the hidden insult punching down. I saw the documentary Eat Sack by the about the virtuoso violinist Eat Sack Perlman. And there's a point where he's back in Israel visiting the violin shop that he got his first violins in. And there's a, the, the violin maker shows a violin that he had reconditioned from Nazi Germany uh, period. And inside it, there's a swastika card. So obviously a German violin maker, knowing it was uh, owned by a Jewish person, had had hidden a swastika within it and the 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 violin maker didn't really know what to do with it he just sort of kept it as this kind of tragic item that he couldn't really give away mm. but he, he he couldn't destroy he just felt he had to to keep so it does it, it that's the only time I've, I've actually seen evidence of it. obviously i've heard the stories as well M my question to you is you very honestly look at all of these <clears throat> urban legends and, uh, and and look at other examples of it which aren't London which is the most London urban legend you have <laughs> one that you you haven't found anywhere else or that you feel is is the the variant of it is so London that it, that it really stands out as a as a true London contemporary legend uh, looking forward to and thank you very much for your talk okay no thank you Joe um well, first, I want to say that, um, yeah, I think hopefully what I stated at the end of talking about the hidden insult is I think that is something that does happen. It's been weaved into the fabric of folklore, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen at all. I mean, urban legends aren't things that haven't happened. They are things that we took, basically talk about. They become conversational and cultural currency. But I'm pretty sure maybe that, um, yeah, that a lot of those stories I told did actually happen. And in a way, they're informed by... Uh, the folklore that maybe the person who wrote blur inside the mixing desk going to the going to oasis maybe had heard the story of the pornography that had been hidden inside the queen's car because when that when the daimler went in to um to have its bomb proofing redone um it was the the, the stuff was found there was a swastika again people are putting swastikas in things idiots and um and pornography hidden in there it's like the, you know the, the lowest things that people could could think of like nazism and jazz mags um, as I mean, I always think of these things as universal. Um, I think the corpse on the tube, even though it is international, is a very London thing. It's all about the, the, the London version is all very much about the anxiety of being on the London underground in a confined space, not trying to pay attention to people. And then a stranger comes to talk to you. It's that that seems very London, but it's and the, I think the London version has that anxiety there while the others um, are a bit more sociable. I think it's true. this is something that's real, but um, I think one one story that has become a legend is uh, a, a, the bridge that the, the Westminster Bridge that goes between the Houses of Parliament to the old um, uh, London County Council uh, offices that are now the Trocadero and the Aquarium and stuff. Um, people, a lot of people, a, a story came out of them that what what you've got there is you've got um there's within 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 the bridge sorry this is normally graphic so um you've got kind of hang on i'll just i'll just i'll tell you what i'll just show you give me a second um
sorry, bear with me. It's a, it's essentially um, something on Westminster Bridge that looks like penises. Um, let me just share my screen again, because obviously I, 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 I'm a sucker for punishing myself with this. There's that essentially. So I've just quick found that on the internet quickly. So you can see that there's kind of um, a three, there's a, there's a design there that's three circles together within the bridge. It's like, um, I don't know, is there a name for that symbol, Gordon? I don't know, the three circles together, like almost a, like a club shape. But when the sun gets quite low, obviously the, the, um, the within the shadow, the sun shining through those things makes penis shapes. And this is Westminster Bridge. You can see the, uh, the red bus on there. Um, and that is just a, an architectural thing that do, that does happen. But I saw a story that Boris Johnson had banned people from travelling over Westminster Bridge at a certain time of day because of the the penises of Westminster. That's again, that's that's quite it's quite a cheeky one. It's almost a hidden insult. Um, but um, that's very London to me. That's uh, really about. Th a, tre a trefoil. Thank you, Bonnie. Oh, lovely to see you, Bonnie. Obviously, I can't see you, but thank you. A trefoil. So, uh, thank you for that question there, Joel. Um, we've got another question on the chat, and we've got somebody pigging, piggybacking on that question as well. So, the question itself, and I'll read the piggyback as well, is from Duncan Saunders. Thank you for the presentation. Do you have a sense of how sincerely people believe these? How often are they shared and received as seriously versus with a sense of humour? No microphone, wise. wise yeah, thing. absolutely wise. And the corollary of that uh, from Brenda Kerr is, um, is it odd that there seems to be no penalty for passing on obvious myths? Even when demonstrated that the story from the sister or friend is essentially a lie that has been told and believed, no shame or social risk seems to be attached, unlike telling a ghost story or UFO site. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, I can't, I can't speak for normal people. I'm not sure how, how they feel when they share these things. Um, oh, hang on. Um, sorry, that's my, my, my laptop just plugging in. Um, I, well, I get a sense, you know, because I, people, I think it's it's somewhere between the idea of sharing a secret or sharing some piece of knowledge, nugget of knowledge that you have that you can share, that sort of um, demonstrates how in the know you are. Also mixed with the idea of just telling a joke. It's um, I mean, but people tell urban legends for lots of different reasons. And some of them have people have their own motives, um, like you, sticking up the underdog with a hidden insult, or uh, being a bit xenophobic with the t with the um, terrorist warning. I think they're shared in lots of different ways. I think some people know they're false and use them to get whatever the the kernel of the message within it to people. Some people share them as a joke. Some people just want to tell a story. It's like I said, the cultural currency that are passed between us all. Um, so. Um, I, 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 there's lots of different ways. It's, it's, every time it's told, it's probably told for a slightly different thing. Some people, I think, do think they're cool people who know the secret history of, of the world and the secret stories and that they are the lords of people. Lots of different reasons. What do you think, Gordon? Um, You're I there. Mean, I might yeah. as well take advantage of you. <laughs> Use me and abuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, people do pass them on as warnings thinking they're, they're the genuine thing my mother uh definitely told me a story and she said oh it's happened to you know her friend so a friend of, of a friend for me as it were um you know so she was passing that on as a warning and she genuinely believed it whether it did happen to a friend because obviously you know just because something's an urban legend doesn't necessarily mean it's not true um i don't know but you know that was passed on as truth um i've definitely had things told to me as oh have you heard the latest one and you know things like that because people you know they, they know like yeah. you are interested in this sort of thing and i'll hold my hand up here i'm actually um responsible for making up an urban legend, not by myself, but 20 year or so ago, this very night, 
um, we had a meeting of the Edinburgh Fortune Society, and it was it was on urban legends. And as part of that evening, we all made one up between us. And we went out and we said, let us go forth and tell this urban legend to people and see if it comes back to us. And we, we set it out into the wild. Uh, Stu was there. He's probably the only other person here tonight who was there. Um, and I've, I've certainly had that urban legend repeated to me. I'm not saying what it is. You're not going to say what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say what it is. It, travel in the wild. But it, it's it's out there. I've had it told to me, so that's that's quite a that's nice situation good. to be. In. It's quite it's quite a hard thing to do. Um, I think Jan the the you know the um, the the god emperor of urban legends is Jan Harald Brunvald, and he I think he writes in one of his books. You know, oh yeah, we've invented this urban legend. It's going to get to you. It's going to get to you, and they never do because they're really difficult things to fabricate. I think if it's an entirely unique tale, not linked to any other tales. It's very difficult to fabricate. Um, maybe one day you can tell me what it is and we can talk some more. Um, I helped share, uh, uh, create an urban legend and I, I can fess it up because Steve Jones wrote about it in the 14 times. We, uh, we had um, someone giving a talk about black dogs for the South East London Folklore Society. Um, and we decided we were gonna fabric fabricate, we we're gonna try and make a black dog appear in the pub as of because we'd previously been at a Centre for Fortune Zoology weekend and we talked about black dogs being thought forms. So we're going to try and, make, try and make one manifest. It didn't happen. Someone did turn up two months later with a white little white dog. That's the nearest we got. Um, but um, then people started seeding this story. So a certain person we know under the name of a, a Doctor Who actor put on a pub review website about how a black dog appears in this pub. And some people who wrote a book for History Press, actually, which the Urban Legend book's out with, found that and put, put it in their book of London haunted pubs that a black dog was seen in this pub. So it kind of went from being made up to appearing in print. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, about, we're about man, we're about people. <laughs> Um, as for should people be should people be punished for sharing myths no, i don't think so um you know so how do you define a myth should people there's 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 the free speech test that we all talk about the sh it's free speech is great but don't shout fire in a count crowded theater to because everyone could run and get crushed um you know don't don't it's it's ethically wrong to mislead people to for your own ends or own amusement but i don't think i don't I'm not sure if we should legislate against that um and off people can people do sincerely share um myths and legends without realizing they're false well we've got to leave uh, us talking about these things yeah <laughs> yeah i'll i'll send you the bill in the uh, in the post um we've got another question now from kim dominican do you think model mo no, sorry do you think modern viral internet urban legends might be a bit more dangerous than the old verbal storytelling? And Stu Smith's come into that with uh, Slender Man certainly was. Absolutely. It's going to have to answer that in two ways, I think. Firstly, pos the way we see the world at the moment, we very much know the harm. You know, we, we benefit greatly from the internet. And, you know, I wouldn't be friends with Gordon possibly without the internet and other people and we wouldn't be we would you know without the 40 on our email list we would probably be quite different people now i'll reflect on that later um um but obviously especially in more recent years with the rise in the popularity of conspiracy conspiracy theories that we used to laugh at in the 1990s are now believed by loads of people and do take action against the world because of them um and that does feel a lot more dangerous. I think there's always been a narrative within folklore, within uh, culture, that others people, that promotes prejudice, that enforces things that maybe aren't the best things for people. Um, but I think the consequences were less recorded because there was far, far less, ordinary people had far less of an opportunity to share their own stories and wh how they think and how they feel. So I think stories have always had some danger to them because it wasn't, it's not always Little Red Riding Hood. 
it is, you know, the Jews in the village are going to execute a baby, like the blood libel and things. There's always been some quite, uh, some quite dangerous stories out there. So yes and no, I think, in conclusion. <laughs> We've got a comment here, uh, it's not a question, um, and it's from Mark Norman of the Fort Oh Law yeah, hey Mark. And, um, you know, um, if any of you have not checked out the uh, the folklore podcast that Mark does, please do so. It's, it is truly excellent. Um, and he's just asking you about the black dog folklore. Yeah. Uh, can you let him have the details of that at some point later yeah um, we'll do we'll i do. must admit we've got a corollary of that as well because at one point at the edinburgh fortune society we had an event where we were trying practical paranormal things a paranormal olympics i think we called it and as part of that we asked the london fortune society steve jones and various other people to concentrate on a black dog appearing in the venue that we were meeting at at the time all as right. well. So we tried to create a a tulpa in that uh did you, in did, that venue. Yeah, it so might have been the south southeast london folklore society yeah that's so. that's exactly what i'm talking about yeah oh is that specifically that that yeah that yeah one? yeah and a light started so. flickering over mark pilkington's head and uh two, two months later people turned up with a with a white dog and that was what happened excellent but then some people seeded the rumor of the dog and it appeared in a in a book about london pubs cool cool I, actually I, I asked the authors because i've put them for talks a couple of times uh, about you know where, where did you hear that story from and they went oh i don't know um they got a bit shifty but it was basically from the beer in the evening website and richard freeman put it there right oops you've just uh outed yeah, your it's, it's, it's all it's all with now. the doctor who name <laughs> um it's all it's all it's all out there now it is yep yep has anyone else got any questions or comments that they would like to ask i can't see any hands up i can't see anything on the uh, on the chat anyone else deathly silence okay i'll just say a few things before we draw the proceedings to a close um, first thing I want to say is that our next meeting of the Edinburgh Fortune Society is on the 13th of April. That one also is going to be a live Zoom meeting. It's actually going to be purely a social meeting um, because the April meeting is our 22nd birthday. Pretty scary in itself. Um, so that will be a Zoom meeting. What are we doing with our lives? Seriously, what are we doing with our lives? Hey, I'd rather be doing this than sitting watching <laughs> a football match personally yeah that's true that's true um yeah, for, for anyone fun. here who's never been to any of the edinburgh fortune society meetings or if this is your first experience of them simply do a search on google edinburgh fortune society that'll bring up our web page that'll bring up our twitter account that'll bring up our facebook all of the details of meetings are put up on there. We also have um, a YouTube channel. It was never specifically designed to be an Edinburgh Fortune Society YouTube channel because we didn't know how long this um, pandemic was going to be lasting. So I, I simply started hosting uh, Edinburgh Fortune Society videos on my uh, meetings, I should say, on my own personal YouTube channel. And then by the time it became obvious that things were going to go on for a bit it seemed a bit crazy to take the videos off and put them up because we'd lose all the comments we'd lose all the views and all that sort of thing uh so i've kept them on my channel but i've made sure that each video does have edinburgh fortune society in the title so it's easy to find the videos of almost a year's worth of talks now um on the youtube channel so we've got all of that. Um, and talking of the Edinburgh Fortune Society Facebook page, we've actually got a poll on the Edinburgh Fortune Society Facebook page at the moment, and it's about the next talk. And basically it is um, an option between two different things. So if you pop along to the Edinburgh Fortune Society page on Facebook, um, there are two options there. Um, I'll read them both out to you. 
One is zoo forms. Zoo form phenomena are the most elusive and least understood mystery animals. Indeed, they are not animals at all and are not even animate in the accepted terms of the word, but entities or apparitions which adopt or seem to have quasi animal form. These arcane and contentious entries, eh, sorry, entities have plagued cryptozoology, the study of unknown animals, since its inception, and they tend to be dismissed by mainstream science as thoroughly unworthy of consideration. But they continue to be seen, and Jonathan Downs, the director of the Center for Fort and Zoology, who first coined the term in 1990, maintains that many zoo forms result from a synergy of complex psychosocial and sociological issues, and suggests that to classify all such phenomena as paranormal in origin is counterproductive and for researchers to dismiss them out of hand is thoroughly un unscientific. So we could potentially have a talk on zoo forms or we could have a talk on the Risley Silverman. Risley is less than four miles from Rixton with Graysbrook, which is where the Weird Weekend North events take place. And it used to host top secret nuclear facilities. Newspaper articles from 1978 asked to, uh, described how Ken Edwards was driving nearby late at night and witnessed a seven foot tall silver figure, which did not appear to have knee joints and was walking stiffly from an embankment. It shone beams of light from its eyes at Ken before walking through a fence and disappearing. Ken reckoned that it had lost an hour of time. Had he seen an extraterrestrial from a UFO? or a ghost, or even an interdimensional visitor. So I'm asking people to vote, do you want to hear a talk on zoo forms, or do you want to hear a talk on Risley Silverman? And who's we'll who's giving the second talk? They're who's both being given by the same person. Oh, right. So it's not like, you know, like Pop Idol or something, or... No, 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 no. For it's, your... it's, it's the same person. It's both John, um, Jonathan Downs. It's not Jonathan Downs, no. Um, it's the same person. It's Glenn Vaudry, also CSA. Okay. Um, and oh, well, you mentioned John earlier on, but yeah. Right. Okay. He, he's offered both of these talks and I as been offering them. I wasn't sure which one to go for, so I thought let's do a poll for it. Um, the idea people, is yeah. that he'll do one of these talks and potentially we'll have him back at some point in the future to, um, to, yeah. uh, to do the other talk. I have, as I was reading that out, seen lots of messages flashing up about people wanting to join the Facebook group. So that's obviously work. That's that's excellent. Thank you very much, folks. So has anyone got any final questions or comments they would like to make before we end the evening? As I say, this particular talk will be edited and will appear on the um, Fortune Society um, web page. Uh, YouTube page and as I say all the details we put on the your usual social media so that you can check that out. There aren't any comments other than people saying thank you very much. So thank you everyone for attending but oh, very well, most then. of all thank you very much Scott for an absolutely excellent talk exactly as I oh, knew it would be. I've heard you speak before thanks. you know I knew it would be great so thank you. It's been thank a long you very time. much President Rutter. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for everyone coming along. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks.